My name's David Brown and we were talking about a little project here along the river and this naturally of course came up with looking at Rod Haig Brown's some of the writing that he's done and uh, because it's summertime right now we thought we'd start with uh, he has a tetralogy four books actually uh, and this one's Fisherman's Summer and his it's so nice to be here on the river and listening to the sound of it and knowing that Rod's somewhere out there is spiritus in the river fishing. So what I'm going to do is just read a few sections from this particular one and we'll do some of the others at a later date. This is an interesting one. Um, as I said, he wrote four books here and uh, he's just so evocative in the way that he writes about how he walks in the river and how he fly fishes and how he talks about fish that it's, it's very, it's just, it's wonderful writing. And actually he wrote this particular book in 1959. It was one of the four, as I said. And of course there's a caveat to all of this. It's, it's the writings of Rod, but Anne, I could never call her Anne, It'd be like calling the Queen Liz, Mrs. Haig Brown, she was such an integral part of all of this. It's, it's like she's sitting here as well, for sure. So in the preface to another edition of this, he said, I still think summer is the pleasantest time to go fishing. Perhaps more than ever now that I'm getting a little creaky in the joints, aren't we all, and more sensitive to the chill of spring and winter, because he has, he did write about fishing in spring and winter. Everywhere in the temperate climates, the precise timing of summer can be quite evasive. In this year of 1974, here on Vancouver Island, summer simply was not until the last third of July. Then it became summer incomparable, gleaming day after gleaming day, and so persisted until the very end of September. Something like this summer for us here in Campbell River, and of course the tragedy of all of the fires up in the north in the Caribou and places like that. And when you th he talks about the seasons and he talks about summer, he this is what he writes. This is how a fisherman, or farmer for that matter, is about seasons. They never quite fit with his, his expectations, but it's always easy to explain why not. Of course, the salmon were a little late this year. That high, hot sun made them reluctant to move into the shallow exposures of the rivers. And when they did come in, the big Chinooks come later and longer to the deep water in the canyon pool and the fast, deep flows elsewhere in the water. Rod and I often would go snorkeling in the canyon pool when the big Chinooks were there and it was absolutely fascinating. We'd slide in by the, where the um, hydroelectric dam is right now. The first part of this theory, but the second part is observation, it matched against dated observation of other years. And he did a tremendous number of writings and chronicling of all the seasons that he fished in the river. Part of it will always be in their predictability, that is if you look at the seasons. What greater joy is there than going back to the same beloved place at the remembered time and finding that it has all kept faith. Whatever made the magic a year ago or 10 years ago is back in place precisely as it should be. Knowledge is vindicated and intimacy somehow affirmed. Yet, if it is different in some degree, if old knowledge is not confirmed, but new knowledge is found, the rewards are just as great and intimacy is extended and enriched. And he finally ends this introduction by saying this, fishermen are searchers. It is true we search for fish at times of great diligence, but we search also as men always have for experiences and there are no greater experiences than the seasons varied and repeated year after year in our special comings and goings. It's interesting, uh, his daughter, oldest daughter Valerie Haig Brown, uh, put a book together called Deep Currents and it's a story of her mom and dad obviously and in one spot she writes that um, with them both working, Anne was the librarian at Cary High, I worked with her for years and years, she was absolutely delightful, kids loved going into the library. Um, and uh, they had that, a 20 acre farm and raising four children and she asked the question, how was there any time for fishing? But anyway, certainly worked it out. This book also happens to be dedicated to the memory of Donald Arthur Lansdowne, age 12, who was drowned when his canoe turned over at Siwash Rock in the Nimkish River, June in 1957. 
And Rod says he knew the waters and loved them. Actually, Rod stayed with the Lansdowns for a number of years when he first came to British Columbia, 1930s. So what we'll do is we'll just pick a couple of sections here that I, I think sort of fit with the season and where we are and the sounds that we hear and everything else like that. Some extraordinary things happened during the construction of the first dams on the Campbell watershed. I remember one day asking an engineer in charge of the work how he expected the water to spread from the surge pool below the powerhouse, I've mentioned that. Would it throw well across the river to the left bank and run down both sides of the big island? Or was it likely to hold to the right bank and pour down along the south side of the island, leaving the other side almost dry? He said he didn't know. I said that if it all went down along the right bank, there would be some pretty drastic changes in the main spawning beds of the Taiyi run. If this happened, would it be possible to put in some sort of a groin or baffle to spread the water properly? He said he supposed so, but hmm, no one had really raised the point. Well, and you think now of what um, BC Hydro is doing in terms of their work and tours, and it's all in the public interest, and so that uh, is so much of a difference. I remember Mrs. Haig Brown, she just gnashed her teeth when Hy around BC Hydro, the days when they would come and clip all the branches off the trees near their property and leave the, some bits of cable and leave some of the branches sitting on the road and all the rest of it. In fact, she had asked them at one time to clean up and it didn't happen, so she took Rod's 12-gauge shotgun and put it over the crook of her arm and went out and said to them, I think you'd better move those wires and keep those leaves, and by the way, keep doing it. And it, I guess it worked, so they certainly do it now. Uh, let's see, oh, there's another one, nice one up in here too. This is about how he would walk in the river. Now, as you know, the Campbell River is a fairly fast-moving stream, and you've got, you've got hip waders or chest waders on. And this is, and you see so many fishermen still in the, in the river. And here's, here's what he writes about it. The secret is in slow and careful movement and in feeling with the feet. I usually move by false casting, which gives one at least a chance to glance down at the bottom. So a false cast is so you can set the fly ahead. I push the leading foot firmly but slowly against the current and feel for solid footing. If there's an obstruction, I feel for a way over or around it without committing myself too far. If there's no way without making the stride too long, I'm content to set the leading foot down and bring the other foot up to it, then try again. This is toward the end of this particular book and the chapter is called What is Good? And he writes, Fisherman's luck is proverbial though I am not quite sure whether it is proverbially good or bad. The fisherman's traditional greeting is supposed to be any luck, though I must say I prefer the more reasonable part of this, done any good, which is an interesting one, or better still, anything moving, which begs the issue of personal performance. The everlasting question of small boys met by the stream side, caught anything is just a little too challenging to be comfortable. So I think we'll, we'll end on this, uh, on this quote. So long as water moves, so long as fins press against it, so long as weather changes and man is fallible, fish will remain in some measure unpredictable. And so long as there's unpredictability, there will be luck, both good and bad. And finally, the last sentence here, it is perfectly true that good fishing is not all luck, but it is just as true that there is no good fishing without some luck. So we'll end, end at that spot. Mm -hmm.